Welcome to ECE 203. This is a lecture on low power analog to digital converters or ADCs. So for those of you following along in the Sarpeshkar textbook, I do recommend reading chapters 15 and 22. And the field of analog to digital converters is uh, enormous. There is tons and tons and tons of papers and uh, products and so on out there on analog to digital converters. If you really want to get into this topic, you can, for example, read the ISSCC data converter sessions over the last 15, 20 years. Lots of Journal of Solid State Circuit papers on analog to digital converters. Uh, you know, there's even a, a course at UCSD that focuses mostly on analog to digital converters. So there's a lot to cover in this space. We are going to do a crash course on the basics of analog to digital converters. And in particular, we wanna em emphasize how to build them in a low power and or energy efficient manner. So analog to digital converters are not anything new by, by any stretch of the imagination. This is a picture of an analog to digital converter that was built in 1954. Okay, as you can see here, this fits uh, you know, on a large bench. It's 150 pounds, it consumes 500 watts. It cost uh, a considerable amount of money back then, um, but it's a, actually a fairly high performance analog to digital converter, 11 bits, 50 kilosamples per second, and it's actually based on the successive approximation register architecture, which is something that we will talk about later on in this lecture. So naturally, this type of analog to digital converter is not something we would use in a you know, wearable or implantable product for obvious reasons. Analog to digital converters have come a long way since then. So why are we as biomedical integrated circuit engineers interested in the design of analog to digital converters? Well, as we mentioned in our earlier lectures, when we're building biomedical systems, we typically have some sort of sensor or transducer that will transduce from signals on the body to some sort of electrical signature that is then typically amplified, although it doesn't necessarily have to be amplified depending on the signal. And then we typically, although again, not always, want to convert it to the digital domain where we can then do some signal processing, we can do some wireless transmission, you know, things like this. Again, we don't always have to do this, but most systems tend to, at some point, uh, convert the signal into the digital domain, at which point, you know, there's many things that we can do. Now within the signal chain, I think it, it's fairly obvious where this fits. We have our sensor input, there's some sort of analog front end that conditions the sensor possibly, or at minimum provides a high impedance for that sensor, you know, whatever that sensor needs to operate uh, correctly. Then this signal is typically, although again, not always amplified before it hits the analog to digital converter. Now, sometimes we will insert a block in between here um, that would do, or I suppose it would be included in the analog block, uh, but this would be analog pre-processing. So the, the default kind of position for most people is you do amplification in order to get the um, high enough signal swing in, in, in advance of your analog to digital converter. And then you digitize and you do all of your processing in the digital domain. This would be through your digital signal processor. Um, but that's not necessary. You know, we talked about circuits like translinear circuits that allow us to do things like multiplication and so on. We can build filters and so on in the analog domain. Sometimes it's better to do this. It's more efficient to do this in the analog domain rather than in the digital domain. But this is highly application dependent. So sometimes we include some analog pre-processing. Most of the time we don't. Uh, we go right into the analog to digital converter. So what does an analog to digital converter do? Well, it converts a continuous time, continuous amplitude signal into a discrete time, discrete amplitude signal, right? That's the conversion from what we would call an analog signal, continuous time, continuous amplitude, to a digital signal, discrete time, discrete amplitude. Okay, and this happens at a sampling rate that we're gonna call F sub S, okay? Now, typically analog to digital converters work in two phases. They work first by converting the uh, continuous uh, time signal into a discrete time signal. This is through a process called sample and hold. And then the second piece is to convert this discrete time signal 
into a discrete amplitude signal, uh, this is through a process called quantization. Okay, so that's typically how a, 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 an analog to digital converter is constructed. Now, of course, doing this process will inevitably, by definition, introduce errors, right? We have a signal that has a immeasurable spectrum of possible analog values, and then we're going to convert it into a signal that has only discrete possible values that also exist only at discrete instances in time. So this introduces error. Now we typically will refer to this as quantization noise. It's not strictly noise, it's not strictly a stochastic process. If you know precisely what your input signal is and where your, your quantization levels are, then this is a deterministic process. Um, but you know, for most uh, purposes, it kind of basically looks uh, like noise. Uh, quantization errors or noise will always exist unless we have an infinite bit uh, analog to digital converter, which of course doesn't work um, or isn't practical. Um, and of course that also would have to have um, infinite time resolution, which again, not practical. So what we say here is that, let's imagine our actual analog signal is this straight line. And then we have these different quantization steps. So we say that the worst case error is going to be what's referred to on this diagram as, as delta over two, or plus or minus delta over two, right? So, so if your signal happens to be here, um, it's very close to the quantization step, and so your error will be pretty small. If it's right on the quantization step, your error will be zero. Um, but if it's in the, right in the middle between these quantization steps, we, we say that that is when we get the very worst case quantization error. So let's go over a few definitions before we get into the design of analog to digital converters. The first definition I want to call is or uh, introduce is VFS, or in other words, the full scale voltage. Now, sometimes this is called VREF. People in the literature are usually fairly loose with their um, nomenclature, so sometimes people will call this VREF, although technically it should be called V full scale. What this means is the maximum voltage an ADC can sense. Any voltage that appears above V full scale at the input to the analog to digital converter will basically just clip and there's no more bits after this that, that will happen. Um, depending on how the analog to digital converter is set up, there may also be a lower limit. You know, it might be ground, but it might be above ground um, depending on how the architecture is set up. Next definition is capital N. This is the number of bits in the analog to digital converter. If there are N bits, then there are two to the N possible digital values at the output of the analog to digital converter. We typically zero reference these values, so they typically vary between zero and two to the N minus one. The third definition I wanna introduce is VLSB. Uh, they call this delta in the Sarpeshkar textbook. And this is the analog voltage level that corresponds to the least significant bit of the um, analog to digital converter. The definition of this is basically it's a V full scale divided by two to the N, assuming that our analog input range starts at zero and goes all the way to V full scale, which again may not be uh, correct, um, but, uh, um, uh, but, but I think you get the point here. So if VLSB is the um, lowest possible analog voltage that can be um, uh, quantized, then the worst case quantization error, as shown on that previous slide, is gonna be plus or minus one half of this voltage. So it's plus or minus one half delta in that previous slide, uh, or in this nomenclature, plus or minus one half VLSB. Now, assuming we don't have a good handle on what our precise analog voltage levels are, and, and let's just assume that we get a even or a white probability distribution function, uh, you know, as averaged over, over you know, the, the time length of our signal, running between minus one half VLSB and plus one half VLSB. So if, assuming we have a white probability distribution function here, then we can figure out the root mean squared quantization error. And that's going to be equal to v square, VLSB squared divided by 12. Okay, so if you have um, 
uh, a least significant bit of the LSB, then the, the error that you're going to have at the output of your signal on average will be V squared LSB divided by 12. Uh, and this is sometimes, um, or VLSB is sometimes referred to as the um, resolution of the ADC. So another important definition that we should learn about is what we call the effective number of bits. So what's really interesting is you can go into the marketplace and look and buy ADCs from various companies, analog, de analog devices, Texas Instruments, and so on. And what's really interesting is you look and, and they'll advertise something called a 10-bit ADC, which presumably has 10 bits. And then you read the data sheet and the data sheet says, well, we have an effective number of bits of 8.9 bits. So what the heck's going on here? So how can you say it's a 10-bit ADC if it actually only has 8.9 bits? What does a fractional effective bit mean? You know, what's going on here? So let's imagine the, the following scenario. Let's say we have a sinusoidal input to the ADC and it has a peak voltage that's exactly equal to V full scale. Okay, so we can go ahead and write the um, signal to noise ratio that we're going to observe from the signal. The signal power, uh, if, the, if the peak to peak voltage, uh, I guess is V full scale, then the signal power will have to get it into RMS units here. So we divide by two and then root two to take the RMS and then to get the power, we square it all. And then we just said that the noise power uh, is equal to VLSB squared divided by 12. Okay, so we can simplify this a little bit. This is V full scale squared divided by VLSB squared times 12 over eight. All right, now let's recall that VLSB is equal to V full scale divided by two to the N. So what we can do is we can take this result and we can take this result um, and it's equal now to three over two times V full scale squared divided by, well, V full scale squared as well, times two to the two N. Okay, so this is equal to three halves uh, times two to the two N. Okay, so if you have the maximum possible input amplitude signal going into your analog to digital converter, then your signal to noise ratio at the output of the analog to digital converter is basically set only by the number of bits that you have available in your analog to digital converter. Now this were if you had a perfect analog to digital converter with no noise existing other than quantization noise. Now, of course, when we build analog to digital converters, that's not the case. Uh, we have other sources of noise in the amplifiers and you know the sample and hold networks and so on that um, will result in a signal to noise ratio that's a little worse than this. And this is really where this notion of the effective number of bits comes into play. Yes, theoretically, a 10 bit ADC should be able to give you 10 bits worth of signal to noise ratio, but due to the noise of the components and so on, um, due to mismatch and, and, and other things of, you know, there, there's distortion and so on that we're not going to talk about yet. Um, your actual signal to noise uh, ratio, or we, we usually measure it as signal to noise and distortion ratio, is going to be less than what we get here. So for a given signal to noise ratio, we can define this upper limit the most possible bits that we could possibly have given the structure of the analog to digital converter. And the effective number of bits is really just the way that we say, well, you know, we don't have a perfect ADC. There's noise sources, there's nonlinearities and so on. Now, as I mentioned, we usually measure this with respect to SNDR or the signal to noise and distortion ratio. So this includes the effects of all the quantization noise, all of the thermal noise, flicker noise, nonlinear uh, distortions and so on. So what we can do is we can take that equation that we had on the previous slide, this three, uh, three halves times two to the two N, and let's convert this into uh, the log domain. And then let's just call this the, the best SNDR we could possibly get, okay? So this is gonna be 10 log of three halves plus 10 log of 
of 2 to the 2 times e knob. Okay, um, and I'm going to replace e knob here with n uh, because I want to use this formula to compute the effective number of bits of my amplifier. So 10 log of, of three, 3 halves, that's, uh, we can just um, numerically write that down, 1.76 plus 20 times e knob times the log of 2. Or in other words, this is 1.76 plus 6.02 times e knob. Okay, so if we had a measured SNDR, which is ultimately what we can measure at the output of our ADC, then we can go ahead and reverse this formula and solve for what the effective number of bits would actually be. So we say that the effective number of bits uh, we would measure by measuring the SNDR in units of dB minus 1.76 divided by 6.02. So if we want to compute the effective number of bits of our analog to digital converter, this is what we would do. We would set up our analog to digital converter. We would input a sinusoid or you know, usually a sinusoid of the maximum possible value, V full scale, into the analog to digital converter. And then we would observe the bits at the output and figure out um, and compute what the signal to noise and distortion ratio is. And then we would insert into this formula and we would compute our effective number of bits. And normally, or rather in all cases, the effective number of bits will be lower than the um, theoretical maximum number of bits of the analog to digital converter because of non-idealities of that converter. So this is the way that you would do that computation. So because analog to digital converters have very well-defined performance specifications vis-a-vis uh, -vis signal to noise and distortion ratio, E knob and uh, you know, a, a power consumption and sampling rate and number of bits and so on, there are some good figure of figures of merit. Uh, I suppose this should be figures of merit, not figures, figure of merits. Okay, there are two good figures of merit. Uh, that we can use to um, compare the performance of one analog to digital converter to another. Again, figure, figures of merit are, are usually used to make kind of more apples to apples comparisons between two designs. You know, if you have one ADC that's working at um, 100 kilosamples per second versus 10 kilosamples per second, obviously, or you know, under normal circumstances, the 100 kilosample per second ADC will consume more power, right? And so how do you know which one is a fundamentally better design? That's where these figures of merit come into play. Okay, so the, the, the first figure of merit that uh, people use is what we'd call the Walden figure of merit. And we call this an empirical figure of merit because it was basically derived by looking at the rough trade-off between power sampling rate and uh, e knob for analog to digital converters back in the day and uh, um, you know there was this kind of rough trend line and that established this figure of merit. So a figure of merit, Walden, is equal to power divided by the sampling rate times two to the power of E knob. And this is in units of joules per conversion step. Okay, now this figure of merit is still very popular, um, in particular used for low power and low and what I would call low to medium resolution ADCs. So upwards, or rather up to around 12 bits or so, we would use this Walden figure of merit. But it turns out this figure of merit is indeed empirical, and as a result, it's not um, kind of showing the fundamental trade-off at work in analog to digital converters. So for that reason, uh, and particularly as we get into higher resolution analog to digital converters, we tend to use the Schreier figure of merit or the thermal figure of merit. And it looks similar. It's defined as power divided by the sampling frequency times two to the two times E knob. Okay, so why do we have this little difference here? So let's recall that the current noise of a transistor in subthreshold is equal to 2qi delta f. Okay, and therefore the input referred voltage noise 
is equal to 2qi delta f divided by gm squared. And gm in subthreshold is proportional to current. And so therefore, the input referred voltage noise is proportional to 1 over the current. As a result, the RMS noise is proportional to 1 over the square root of the current uh, being processed by, by that tr transistor. So the reason why we go 2 to the 2 times E knob is because if we are thermal noise limited in our analog to digital converter, which if you do everything else right, you will ultimately be thermal noise limited, then if we want to reduce thermal noise by a factor of 2 for the same bandwidth, we say ISO bandwidth means for the same bandwidth, we require four times more current or power consumption to be dissipated in our circuit. So this figure of merit, the Schreier figure of merit, or we call it sometimes the thermal figure of merit, captures this trade-off perfectly. Okay, so if you want to compare two designs and one has a higher E knob and lower power and one has a, a lower E knob, um, sorry, let me start over. If we're comparing a high E knob design, it's gonna have high power. If we're comparing a lower E knob design, it's gonna have lower power. And if the power for the same sampling rate scales by a factor of four for every two uh, in scaling of thermal noise, then the figure of merit for these two analog to digital converters should be exactly the same. So we can do a very good apples to apples comparison. So for this reason, the Schreier figure of merit is actually a much uh, more logical figure of merit. It's, a, it's grounded in, in the fundamentals of, of noise in um, at least uh, in subthreshold transistors or uh, bipolar transistors, although the, the trade-off is largely the same in above threshold as well. So here is a plot of figure of figures of of the of well I guess um, the energy per uh, on chip energy per sample versus the measured effective number of bits for uh, a large collection of different analog to digital converters published over a time from 1983 to 2013. Okay, so what we can see here is these these rough trade-offs. So for example, look in 1988. So these bold uh, colored lines are basically what we'd say as the frontiers uh, at that particular instant in time. So these were the best published results of analog to digital converters uh, at each effective ENOB. Okay, so what we saw here in 1988 is, well, we were nicely following this Walden slope. Okay, so this Walden slope is based on that Walden figure of merit. And we can see here that, you know, uh, as we go up in ENOB, we require, you know, a little bit more energy uh, according to the, the Walden relationship. But as we start to continue to improve our ability to design analog to digital converters, we very quickly started to realize that this Walden slope is not actually capturing the trade-off correctly. What we're finding is that the thermal slope, as um, indicated by the Schreier or the thermal figure of merit, is a much better predictor of the ultimate efficient frontier within this uh, plot here. So as you, in, as you desire to increase the effective number of bits, then indeed you will require uh, proportionally more energy per conversion or, or more energy per sample according to the thermal figure of merit. So this is why the thermal figure of merit is, is very good. Now, one thing you will notice is there's a little bit of this plateauing below 10 bits of, of ENOB. And that just means that uh, effectively, at least uh, all the way up to 2013, for low resolution analog to digital converters, we tend to not necessarily be limited by thermal noise or shot noise. Uh, and instead we're limited by other things, you know, the overhead of peripheral circuits and switching and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so as a result, that's why we tend to sometimes use the Walden figure of merit when we're talking about lower resolution ADCs. But when we're talking about high resolution ADCs, it's really all about that thermal figure of merit. So given all those definitions and discussions of trade-offs and so on, what are the requirements that we have for analog to digital converters for biomedical applications? Well, of course, um, the answer is it depends on the application. Uh, it strongly depends on the application. But in general, let's look at an example for, say, ECG. 
ECG, as we said, the bandwidth is about 250 hertz. Therefore, the sampling rate must be at least about 500 hertz if we want to do Nyquist sampling. And the dynamic range of the signal is roughly on the order of, let's say, 5 microvolt to 5 millivolt. Uh, that would be the, the, the range we'd like to be able to capture. That's a, a range of about 1,000. Um, so if we say 1,000 uh, is equal to 2 to the n, then we can very quickly uh, count that uh, or compute that n must be around equal to something like 10 bits if we want to capture with reasonably good fidelity uh, the whole dynamic range of ECG. So that would be the minimum requirement that we would need. In clinical ECG applications uh, or in wearable ambulatory ECG applications, we can have significant baseline drift uh, or, um, or motion artifacts, uh, particularly in ambulatory ECG. Um, and so as a result, we require a much larger dynamic range. Let's call it five microvolts to five volts. Five volts is perhaps a little high, but uh, but five microvolts is perhaps a little low. So, you know, something on this order. And so this ends up requiring a dynamic range of one million. Okay. Um, now, if you go ahead and do the calculation, one million is equal to two to the N, this means that we need 20 bits. All right, that is extreme. Um, that's probably actually excessive, um, although you know some designs are starting to to to, to get up there um, that we we really need if we really truly want to be tolerant to large artifacts or baseline drift. So let's just go through a quick numerical calculation here. Again, let's stick with ECG and let's say we have 500 uh, hertz. Uh, that's our sampling rate, and we have 10 bits. So according to the plot that I showed earlier, state-of-the-art uh, ADCs, at least as of 2013, which is a little old now, but, uh, but it's still on the right order of magnitude, have a Walden figure of merit of about two picojoules per sample. Okay, or they, they, I should more specifically say they require two picojoules per sample. So we can quickly do a power consumption calculation based on that plot. Power is going to be, well, two picojoules per sample times 500 samples per second, okay? So this is equal to one nanowatt. All right, so that sounds really great. Super great, actually. Um, in practice, it's much higher than this. Um, because this is actually a very low sampling rate. Uh, most of the uh, kind of record setting designs in that plot tend to sample much faster. When you're sampling at very low sampling rate, you get really, you tend to get very dominated by leakage power um, to the point where it can really, you know, affect uh, the operation of your, or, or the, the overall power consumption of your circuit. So in, in practice, if you just take one of those designs and you sample it at 500 hertz, you're gonna consume much more than one nanowatt. Now there are work, including some uh, work uh, through my own research group, where we specifically try and address this problem and, and try to very much optimize the operation of the, of the ADC at these low sampling rates so that we can approach these kind of numbers. And indeed, in, in one of our, our papers a few years ago, we were able to get uh, down to about one nanowatt of operation for roughly similar types of uh, sampling rates. So, so the question we would ask ourselves is why uh, is it much higher than this? Uh, that's the question. And the answer is it's because of leakage, right? So, so, so your, your, your leakage doesn't increase, your leakage power doesn't increase when you go down to low sampling rates but the length of time that you must integrate that leakage power over increases uh, as you go down in lower sampling rates. And, uh, and from an energy perspective, that really kills you. Okay, so let's now redo this calculation for 12 bits and 20 bits. Okay, so if it's 12 bits, uh, the state-of-the-art results are about 100 picojoules per sample. So times 500 Hertz, this gives us 50 nanowatts. Uh, it turns out that um, the same is true here. In practice, it's usually gonna be a, a little higher than this. And then if we go to 20 bits, 
we need 10 microjoules per sample times 500 hertz. This is equal to 5 milliwatts. So that's a pretty significant power jump, right? We're talking about going from nanowatts to milliwatts as we want to increase the um, effective number of bits of our design all the way up to this very, very large level. Now, 20 bits is probably fairly, or indeed rather quite overkill. Uh, and some of the recent, uh, more, more recent research results coming out of my group are, are suggesting that, you know, S and DRs in the order of 90 dB or something like this are, are, are perfectly acceptable for a lot of these uh, ambulatory ECG or EEG applications. Uh, and that's kind of where the literature is going. And importantly, we've been able to demonstrate this at microwatt level power consumptions. So in terms of uh, the various types of analog to digital converter architectures, there's you know roughly four main types of, of ADC architectures. Uh, and we'll talk about several of these uh, today. In general, they're kind of spread out in terms of their general suitability for different kinds of applications. If we have a small number of bits that we need and with very fast sampling rate, then the best kind of architecture for that case is something like a flash ADC. Uh, on the other hand, uh, biomedical signal as, signals tend to require lower sampling rates um, and medium to higher number of bits. Um, and so I've kind of indicated the standard biomedical requirements here. And these tend to be dominated by successive approximation register analog to digital converters and delta sigma analog to digital converters. Now, we are not going to discuss delta sigma converters. Um, I would love to discuss them. They are extremely interesting. Um, not discussed. Uh, if you want to see more, see ECE uh, 264. Um, they, they talk about them. These are very useful. And in fact, we're seeing increasingly, increasingly large adoption of Delta Sigma type analog to digital converters into the biomedical space as we want to go to higher and higher resolutions. And we've been finding ways to make them uh, low power as well. But they are you know, a little complicated. They take a little while to understand and we just don't have the time to cover this in, in one single lecture. Another type of ADC architecture that doesn't really find a whole lot of use in biomedical applications, although we, we will talk about them as a means to introduce the, the SAR architecture, is a pipeline architecture. Um, these architectures tend to be well suited for uh, higher sampling rate and medium resolution types of applications. Okay, so let's <clears throat> take a look at a circuit that does sample and hold operation. Uh, so there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, here's one possible way. Uh, this is what we call open loop sampling. So the idea here is we want to sample the voltage onto a capacitor. In this case, I'm drawing it as two capacitors, but let's just pretend that there's one capacitor there for now, or in other words, these are being operated in parallel. The reason we've drawn it this way will be clearer uh, for other reasons uh, shortly. So. A capacitor is actually a great place to do voltage sampling, right? Uh, you have the two switches enabled. You're sampling the input voltage onto this capacitor. And then when you open the switches, your input voltage is now sampled onto this capacitor. And you can go ahead and use this capacitor, you know, to, as a discrete time thing to do other things with it. Now, note that when we do operate the sample and hold circuit, we typically want to operate the two switches. We call them phi1 and phi1a we want them to have a slightly different timing. Uh, and in other words, what we want is phi 1a to turn off a little sooner than phi 1. And the reason is for charge injection purposes. So whenever you build a switch like this, it's built out of transistors. And when the transistor is on, you get charge accumulating in the channel of the transistor. And then when you turn the tr transistor off, that charge needs to go somewhere. And that somewhere could go and perhaps corrupt the signal introducing some you know distortion or nonlinearity or uh, if it's in input signal level dependent and so we'd like to avoid that so what happens is when phi 1a turns off it sees a high impedance or, or it sees you know a, a higher impedance looking up and it sees basically zero impedance looking down. So from this perspective, all of the charge is going to go fl flow down through that switch. Now, meanwhile, when phi 1 finally turns off after phi 1a has turned off, 
On this side, it's going to see capacitor C2, and then C2 and it is just basically an open circuit here. So it's a very high impedance, whereas looking back this way to our source is going to be a much lower impedance. And so the charge injection uh, from the switch is going to prefer to go back towards the source rather than storing on the capacitor. And so doing it this way is a, a nice way to minimize signal dependent charge injection. So now that we've sampled and held our signal, we need to quantize it. We need to convert it into the discrete amplitude domain. And one of the simplest ways to do this is through what we call a flash analog to digital converter. So our VIN signal here, we assume it's now been sampled and held. And now what we're going to do is we're going to quantize it through a resistor string and a series of comparators. And the idea here is the resistor string is just used to generate a bunch of different reference levels. So if this is uh, VREF, this is uh, zero volts at ground, then this is just VREF over four. This is um, VREF over two, and this is three VREF over four. And we, we look at our input signal and say, okay, um, is it larger than zero? If so, then this comparator will trigger. Is it larger than VREF over four? Then this comparator will trigger. And maybe it's not larger than VREF, so this guy and this guy won't trigger. And so we, what we get here is basically a thermometer encoded uh, signal, which we can then pass through a thermometer to binary logic converter to get our uh, binary output voltage, or sorry, binary output digital code. So this uh, works, it's very simple. Uh, it works reasonably well. In fact, this is the fastest kind of ADC one can typically build. However, this gets very quickly difficult to do as we scale to many bits. So for each N bits, we need two to the N comparators. So an eight bit flash ADC requires 256 comparators and 256 voltage reference levels. So this can get very quickly unwieldy. Right. So for this reason, flash ADCs are not typically used for high resolution applications, but rather they're typically used for uh, fast sampling applications. You know, these can work at giga samples per second, etc. But let's talk about how we would build that comparator, because we will use comparators for most of our other ADC structures. Now, there are many ways that we could build a comparator. One is we could just use a differential amplifier. If the difference between VIN and VREF is large enough, then the current is going to be steered to one uh, path or one branch or the other very, very sharply, and V out is going to go from a very high voltage to a very low voltage and vice versa. So a benefit, I guess I don't know if this is actually a benefit, but it's a traditional, well understood design. Um, you know, we've already studied this kind of structure already. We could, if we wanted to, if we don't get enough gain out of one of these stages, we could cascade uh, multiple stages for more gain if we wanted to. And uh, this is an analog amplifier. And although we haven't really talked about this, it's easy to uh, do something that we call auto zeroing. Um, to reduce the input referred offset voltage uh, and possibly some one over F noise, depending on how you do it. Basically what this does is involves wrapping um, in feedback around this amplifier uh, capacitor, which if there is any offset voltage, it'll be stored across this capacitor, which we can then put in series with the input in order to effectively cancel out the, the, the offset voltage of the circuit. So these are some of the advantages of this kind of comparator structure. The drawbacks are, well, this is an analog circuit. It consumes a constant bias current. Okay, so it's always drawing a current, so therefore it becomes possibly energy expensive. And if this is implemented in an advanced CMOS process, one stage will have fairly low gain. So low gain in advanced technologies. So this requires more cascading and more power.
So the two main problems for the previous amplifier-based structure were the constant bias current and the lack of gain. And so a really popular alternative is what we would call a regenerative feedback sense amplifier. Uh, this is often called a sense amplifier because they are always uh, or often used in memory cells and digital circuits uh, because they're trying to sense a bit line discharge or something like this. And they do so with basically a comparator like structure. So this is a good example of, of this type of circuit. Some people call this circuit a strong arm comparator uh, from the strong arm uh, family, you know, arm technologies. And so the basic idea is as follows. You get a differential pair. In this case, we have a PMOS differential pair with inputs V plus and V minus. And instead of going to a normal linear load, what we go to here is a back-to-back -back inverter based load. Okay, and so the idea here is as follows. Before we activate this circuit, we pre-discharge all of the nodes in the circuit with these pre-discharge switches. And the clock is zero or sleep is zero and so, or sorry, one. And so this, this uh, 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 header PMOS transistor is turned off. Now, as soon as the clock is, uh, I guess in this case, deasserted because this is a PMOS transistor, then what ends up happening is the there's current starts to flow in these branches and if v plus is not equal to v minus then there's going to be a difference in current flowing through this circuit this difference in current will then pass into these back-to-back -back or uh, you know cross-coupled inverters and the inverters are basically in a positive feedback loop and they're going to take any small if imbalance in current that's going through their, their, their supply paths and really rapidly latch or, or flip-flop into a valid logic state. Okay, so this cross-coupled structure offers a tremendous amount of gain in the process when it's trying to make a decision. Now, once the back-to-back uh, -back inverter structure has made a, you know, a, a quick decision, and let's say this node here is at VDD and this node here is at zero, then what you'll note here is even if clock is zero and there's nominally a path for current to go through this header transistor, what you'll see is that, well, there's nowhere for the current to eventually go. So if this is VDD, then this NMOS transistor here is on, but this PMOS transistor is off. And likewise, if this is zero, this NMOS transistor is off, but this PMOS transistor is on. So there's no path for the current to flow. So as a result, there is no static power. This is a great benefit of this structure. Of course, um, there's always leakage power. Um, we can never totally get rid of that. Um, but uh, to first order, there's no static power for this circuit. So as a result, the only power that this circuit uh, consumes is CV squared F power. All right, so that's a major advantage. And then the other advantage of the circuit is that the regenerative aspect, the regeneration, has tremendously high gain. You can take a very small input differential signal and through this positive feedback mechanism, it will resolve eventually into a logic one or a logic zero. And usually it does this actually extremely quickly. Okay, so for this reason, these two things basically solve all the problems that we had with that prior circuit. Now there are some downsides of this circuit. Um, it can have significant offsets. significant offset voltages. Now, because this is now what we would call a, a digitally clocked comparator, it, this only makes a comparison on the rising, or in this case, the falling edge of clock, um, there's, there's no real way to auto zero this amplifier. So if you do have an input referred offset voltage due to mismatch in any of your transistors here, you can't correct it through auto zeroing. What you typically have to do is some sort of capacitive trimming uh, shown here with the COS plus and the COS minus uh, digital bits or digital DAC here. 
where basically if you add a little bit of capacitance to the output, you'll intentionally slow down one side versus the other to make it such that when the two inputs are, are even, um, the, uh, the, the output will have a random distribution of, of ones or zeros, okay? So because of this offset issue, this, this circuit also has some interesting input referred noise properties that are also rather difficult to simulate. We have to do some special kind of simulations uh, to model this. But for these reasons, we typically can use such a structure. It's typically okay for up to eight bits uh, for ADCs. If you want to use this kind of comparator for your ADC and you're targeting for more than eight bits, then you typically need some amount of preamplification uh, required after this, if only to gain up that signal and make sure that you have enough uh, voltage swing in front of this comparator, which has noise and offset problems. Okay, um, and if you do put a preamplifier in front of this circuit, then you can do all that good stuff like auto zeroing and you can control the noise of that preamplifier well by burning the appropriate amount of current and or sizing the transistors for flicker noise reasons and so on. You can do all that good stuff well, as you can normally do with amplifiers. Now, adding capacitors to the output nodes here um, is a good way to trim any potential offset voltages, but this is explicitly adding capacitance, which of course adds extra CV squared F power consumption. So one way to get around that power consumption is instead of adding capacitance, you use current starving, or you adjust the effective width of the input transistor pair in order to adjust the relative current of each branch. So this is an example of a circuit uh, in which I did this, where uh, you can see that the input Vs plus and Vs minus is attached to uh, M1 and M2, but then also to a bank of extra uh, transistors here with some uh, enabled transistors associated with them that you can digitally control in an attempt to adjust the offset voltage of this comparator without um, adding as much capacitance as you would by explicitly adding capacitors. Now, of course, adding these transistors adds capacitance, but these transistors can be pretty small and they hopefully won't add too much. So let's get into a few different types of possible other analog to digital converters. Uh, one type is what we would call an algorithmic ADC. And the idea here is that these kind of ADCs will go through different uh, cycle of n different conversions in order to quantize uh, the analog input into an n bit digital code. And so the basic idea here is you take a look at your input voltage, and I've you know indicated some you know representative input voltage over here, and you make a comparison. You say, is this input voltage higher or lower than V full scale over two? Okay, so you just take the your V full scale divided by two. That's something typically easy to do. And you say, am I bigger or lower than that? If I'm bigger, then clearly my MSB. Uh, should be equal to one, right? And then what I do is I take the remaining, uh, th this analog value, and I multiply it by two, and I make sure to subtract V full scale over two, so that basically this remaining analog value will now be somewhere between uh, you know, V full scale over two and V full scale, but it looks like to the next comparator that it's somewhere between zero and V full scale because I've, multi I've, I've amplified it by a factor of two. And let's say in this representative, representative example, I'm somewhere below over here. So in this case, I would say, well, my MSB minus one, or my next MSB is equal to zero, okay? So then I'd repeat this process. I'd again, amplify the signal by two, make sure to subtract out the, uh, the remaining V full scale range that I don't want, amplify it back up and again, do this comparison. And so let's say I've landed down here. So my next MSB is equal to zero and so on and so forth. So you can see here, you, can, you only have to do n comparisons to get an n bit digital code. And there's no thermometer to binary encoding or anything like this. It's just very uh, simple. So this is a simple or uh, a representative implementation of doing something like that. Uh, this is actually pulled from the Sarpeshkar textbook. We have a sample and hold. 
uh, that goes, or there's a, the input goes through a mux into a sample and hold that then goes to the comparator. And the output of the comparator will go to a register that will register, you know, the, the bit sequence of the, of the uh, units here. And then we have this VREF, uh, in this case, it's VREF over four, just, uh, you know, based on the units that uh, the Sarpeshkar text ended up using here, that we then add to the sample and hold signal. We then multiply by two and we put this back into the sample and hold and back into the comparator and we re repeat this process uh, all the time. So this kind of structure certainly does work. This particular structure is not super common. Uh, what we typically see is something like a pipeline ADC or something like a SAR ADC that uses this general concept. So let's go ahead and talk about the first one, uh, the pipeline ADC now. So the idea with a pipeline ADC is you wanna take that, that previous architecture that I showed on the, on the previous slide there, but the downside of that architecture is you sample and then you have to go through this process where you cycle through these, uh, um, you know, adding uh, VREF over two or VF, VREF over four, depending on the numerology. And you keep on doing this. And then once you finally have your conversion, then you can finally take a new sample. Okay. So the idea with the pipeline ADC is once you've done that first comparison, then you can pass that next comparison off to a subsequent sample and hold and a subsequent stage. And then you can go ahead and sample in a new waveform into your first stage. Okay, so in this case, we're saying stage zero, we'll have a sample and hold. We'll go through this one bit analog to digital com conversion process, which is just your comparator that creates your, your first output bit. And then you take this output bit, you uh, convert it back into a digital code, you take this guy and you add it, or rather you subtract the two and then you multiply by two. And then this goes into a subsequent stage, another sample and hold. And once this value has gone through this sample and hold, you can now go ahead and sample in a new value of the input signal. So this is why we call it a pipelined analog to digital converter. So one question that we have is, how do we implement that two times gain? Okay, so we're gonna go back to that input sample and hold circuit that we looked at earlier. Oops, let me draw this a little bit better. Okay, so we had these two branches. We had this mysterious C1 and C2 capacitors here, C1, C2. This was phi one, phi one and the output of this guy was connected to ground and this was connected to, you know, phi one, um, um, you know, slightly phi one A or something like this, I think, right? And when phi one is on, we say that we are in the sampling phase and we say that VC one is equal to VC two is equal to V in. But when we're in the phi one bar phase, we say we are in the hold phase. And still here, VC1 is equal to V, oops, equal to VC2 is equal to the input voltage. Okay, so in other words, the total charge on the system is V in times C1 plus C2. Okay, so, so far, this is pretty straightforward. So now let's rearrange this circuit. Okay, specifically, I'm gonna take C2 and I'm gonna put it like this, and then I'm gonna take its input and put it into the negative terminal of a op amp. And then I'm gonna take C1 and connect it in feedback across this op amp. And this is V out and this is C1, okay? So in this case, this node here is a uh, virtual ground so what we can say is um, there's no more charge on C2, right? It has a ground on both sides. So all the charge must now exist across C1. So we can say that Q prime total or the total charge in this new phase is equal to V out times C1, right? Because uh, C1 is V out on one side and a virtual ground on the other side. Now there's nowhere else for this charge to have gone. And so this must be equal through conservation of charge to the original amount of charge, which we said above is equal to V1 times C1 plus C2. So therefore what we can say is V out over V in 
during this process is equal to C1 plus C2 over C1. Now if C1 is equal to C2, then we can say that the gain is equal to 2, precisely. Okay, as long as C1 is matched to C2, the gain of this circuit will be equal to 2. So this is a nice way to leverage the fact that we have to do sampling and then rearrange these capacitors and feedback across an op amp. Not shown are the switches on how to actually do this rearrangement, but you would need some extra switches to, to, to accomplish this rearrangement. But once you do so, you can get a nice gain of very precisely two. So that's a nice way to do this. So I would like to explore the, the reason we need to have this op amp here. The, the, the fundamental reason why we need this op amp, or I guess it's not technically fundamental, but the reason we choose normally to use this op amp is to force the virtual ground condition on node VX here. By forcing through the feedback of this circuit, node VX to be at zero, we are making sure that all of the charge from C2 moves its way over to C1. And so what ends up happening is, is this requires some exponential settling. Okay, so if VO initially, when we go, we, we enter this feedback state is some low value, then what happens is the output of this op amp must charge C1 until the point where, well, VX is equal to zero, right? Because VX is not going to be equal to VCM here. Um, so we need to charge VX or discharge, depending on the, the polarity here charge or discharge Vx until its value precisely equals Vcm. At that point, Vo will now enter our 2x gain state. Okay, so in order for this to happen, this op amp, uh, this op amp uh, needs high gain. It needs high gain to make sure, and low offset, I should also say, to make sure that when Vx is equal to Vcm, the charging precisely stops, so we get precisely this, um, this uh, gain of two. So if you plot, or if you write a formula for the output voltage, Vo of n, we're in discrete time land now, the uh, voltage will be C1 plus C2 divided by C1 times Vn, times, well, n minus a half. So the, basically the, the, the previous uh, input voltage here. So it's the only purpose this op amp is serving is to make sure that Vx eventually equals Vcm. And it does a fine job, and this is how most people typically implement this, but this isn't the only way that you have to implement this kind of circuit. One other possible way is to just charge it with a current source. Okay, and so the idea here is building op amps, particularly in scaled CMOS technologies, is more difficult than it used to be in, in less scaled technologies. Building comparators, on the other hand, is, is more straightforward. Okay, um, and so the idea here is why don't you take a current source, use that current source to linearly ramp the voltage at the output and at therefore at node VX, or unramp, uh, you know, depending on the polarity of your of your signal here, uh, ramp the voltage Vx until it hits the common mode uh, Vcm over here, at which point you just shut the current mirror off. And at this point, the output voltage is going to be at the right value. Okay, so the advantage here is we can implement, oh boy, long M, implement uh, this comparator um, or implement this circuit with a simple comparator. Okay, um, and if you go and, and look at the math, you'll find that the output voltage is exactly the same as it was with the op amp, except now you don't need an op amp, you just need a comparator and a current source. Okay, so this technique may or may not be advantageous. Uh, what I like about this technique is it kind of goes back and rethinks the purpose of what these circuits are being used for. Um, and perhaps this technique offers some advantages, perhaps it doesn't. I think there's uh, some debate uh, still on, on the merits of this technique. Uh, again, this particular circuit is perhaps a little too simple. You probably need a more complicated circuit in order to um, 
uh, realize the full uh, benefit of, of such a technique. Uh, but uh, some of my uh, former colleagues did uh, try and implement this uh, as a pipeline converter and achieved you know, decent uh, results. Of course, there's uh, much better results particularly available now, but it was a nice demonstration of this kind of uh, technology or this kind of technique. And that's what I often like to see in uh, research papers is, you know, let's get down to the fundamental issues that are uh, we're having difficulty with and are there interesting ways that we can overcome them or replicate the same kind of functionality using circuits that are more amenable to the type of technologies uh, that we have available to us. And this is one possible uh, approach to do so. So the meat of analog to digital converters in the biomedical space is largely in successive approximation ADCs. Um, at least certainly for low to medium resolution applications. Uh, of course, for high resolution applications, it's really delta sigma ADCs that, that are the, the, the meat in the biomedical space. So anyways, let's get into a successive approximation ADCs. The idea here is basically it's an algorithmic ADC. We sample and hold the input. We compare that to the output of some digital to analog converter. Uh, through a comparator, and then we cycle through different codes in the digital to analog converter in a binary um, approximating way, a binary search approximation, or binary search, I guess, um, and feed the outputs into what we call a successive approximation register. Okay, so it's interesting. Um, the word SAR or successive approximation register is commonly used um, even if it doesn't necessarily no longer refer to a register, uh, but the, the word SAR has kind of uh, percolated throughout the, the literature. Now, what most people do when they build a SAR ADC in CMOS is they combine um, these two features, the n-bit digital to analog converter and the sample and hold structure. So let's just look algorithmically, uh, you know, what happens. Let's say we have a VN input voltage that's right around here. So a VN is, you know, the, we sample and hold it, and then we compare VN to VREF over 2. And in this case, VN is larger than VREF over 2, so our first bit is logic 1. Our MSB is logic 1. And then we compare VN to, um, in this case, 5 over, uh, no, sorry, um, 3 quarters uh, VN, or v, 3 quarters VREF. And we say, is are we higher or lower than that? In this case, we are lower, so our next MSB is 0, and uh, you know, so on and so forth as we continue to make our decisions here. So this is the, the basic structure of a, of a SAR ADC. What we typically do, as I mentioned, is we typically combine the functionality of sample and hold with the n-bit digital to analog converter. So what we do in particular here is we sample our input voltage onto a binary weighted bank of capacitors that we can reconfigure in order to basically create a digital to analog converter. Now, one interesting thing here is, is you can see this is a binary weighted bank of capacitors. So we go from 2 to the n minus 1 times c all the way down to c. We have an extra c over here, um, and this is used to get perfect division by 2. So in other words, i.e., the total capacitance here is 2 to the n, not um, 2 to the n minus 1. Okay. All right. So we will kind of step through. The circuit might look a little scary uh, and complicated to those of you who haven't seen it before. Uh, we will kind of step through here and, and uh, see the operation step by step. But again, basically the idea is the input voltage will first get sampled onto all of these capacitors all at once. So all of the capacitors in the sample phase will, will sample on. So these switches will all be closed uh, in this position over here. Um, so we'll sample all of these. Um, now, interestingly, we'll be, uh, we'll be sampling them onto, I guess, what in this case would be drawn as the bottom plate of the capacitors. 
Over here we have a uh, virtual ground condition uh, during the reset phase. So we're sampling on um, onto these capacitors. And then once we've sampled, then we will attach these capacitors to various sequences of reference voltages and so on uh, in order to uh, go through this algorithm, this uh, binary search algorithm. So here's the, the basic process is first we take our input voltage and we sample it onto this two to the N times C of capacitance while the circuit is in this reset phase, uh, which by the way is also um, an auto zeroing phase. So if there's any offset voltage in this amplifier, it will also get sampled onto the voltage of this capacitor in addition to V in. Okay, so again, the voltage across this capacitor is going to be uh, V in minus the offset voltage during this phase. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, or part B in this case, is we disconnect the input voltage. We've now done our sampling operation and we connect this terminal of the uh, capacitor array to ground. Okay, and so with respect to this terminal here, and we've now opened this switch, with respect to this terminal, we are now seeing V offset minus V in on this terminal. And then what we do is we successively connect the MSB capacitor to VREF while leaving the other guys grounded. Um, and then the next MSB to VREF while leaving the other capacitors, the, the LSBs grounded and whatever appropriate state for the previous bit uh, still connected as we cycle through the array. Okay, again, this may look a little um, difficult to understand. Uh, so let's go through this uh, in a couple uh, representative steps. So step one, is we sample. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to say it's minus Vn across 2 to the n C. I've already done this inversion step. So we can say that the charge in, in um, phase 1, Q1, is equal to minus Vn times 2 to the n times C. Okay, so that would be phase 1 or, or step 1. In step 2, what we're going to do is we're going to connect Vref to um, the first MSB, that's 2 to the N minus 1 times C. Okay, this voltage here is Vx. This is 2 to the N minus 1 times C over here as well. So what we say here is that in Q2, we get Vx times 2 to the N minus 1 times C plus Vx minus V, oops, minus V ref times 2 to the n minus 1 times c. Okay, that's just the, the charge across these uh, two, two different capacitors here. Now, due to converse, conservation of charge, we say that q1 must be equal to q2, and so therefore minus 2 times vn must be equal to vx plus vx minus v ref, where all of these 2 to the n's and so on, they all uh, cancel out. So what we say here is that Vx is now equal to minus Vn plus Vref over 2. Okay, and this is actually the operation we were looking for. We want to compare Vn to Vref over 2. And basically by taking Vn and adding Vref over 2, we're able to do this effectively. So we can say here is that if Vx in this case is less than zero. Keep in mind polarities and so on. Uh, we can't actually have a voltage less than single-endedly less than ground. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're building this differentially, it's obvious how that would work. If Vx is less than zero, then the MSB we say in this case is equal to one. Otherwise, if Vx is greater than zero, we say the MSB is equal to zero. So you can see how we can arrive at this conclusion simply by looking at the output of a comparator. Okay. Uh, step three. So if the MSB was one, then what we would do here is we would leave it connected to VREF. 
And then what we would do is we would connect the ref to a capacitor of two to the n minus two times C, the next MSB. We would leave the two to the n minus one C capacitance connected to VREF, and then we would connect everything else to ground. So the rest of the capacitors is two to the n minus two times C, and this is node VX here. Okay, so we can go through a similar kind of calculation. Q1 is equal to Q3 through conservation of charge, which is equal to VX times two to the n minus two times C plus VX minus VREF times two to the n minus one plus two to the n minus two times C. And this is all equal to minus VN times two to the n times C. So what we can do here is again, solve VX plus VX minus VREF times three is equal to minus four times VN. And then we can say here that VX is equal to minus VN plus three over four VREF. So again, this is giving us what we want. We wanted to be able to compare our input voltage, in this case, because the MSB was equal to one, to three quarters VREF. If the MSB were equal to zero, then we wouldn't have kept that MSB capacitor connected to VREF, we would have connected it to zero, and we would have gotten a formula that said VX is equal to minus VN plus one quarter VREF, okay, which would allow us to do that other comparison. So you can see how this becomes a binary decision tree where we successively look at the input voltage and compare it to various uh, fractional levels of VREF until we end up getting our digital output. So why do we like SAR ADCs for biomedical applications? Well, the main reason is they don't consume static power. This is great, right? The, the only active circuits in here is a comparator and some switches, and those do not consume static power, unless of course you have a preamp in front of your uh, comparator, but for most RIDCs in the up to 10 bit or so range, you probably don't need that preamplifier if you design your, your make your design careful. There is power consumption, of course, there's CV squared F power consumption or CV squared switching energy. And of course there's leakage and so on. But in theory, with this structure, your sampling rate will determine your ultimate power consumption. Your power scales with the sampling rate if you ignore leakage. So as a result, you can design this SAR ADC to work at 100 kilohertz, and it'll also work very perfectly fine at 500 hertz for your ECG application. Now it might not be super energy efficient there because you will start to get killed by leakages, but, uh, but this is kind of a nice way to um, uh, make sure uh, that you have uh, ultimately quite low power consumption. Now there are many tricks that one can implement to help reduce the power consumption of a SAR ADC. So conventionally in a binary, in your capacitive binary weighted array here, you have you know, capacitors going from your MSB to your LSB, and you get this huge ratio, right? Your, your, MS, your, sorry, your LSB is, is, let's call it C0 or C0, and your MSB is two to the nine C0 for a 10 bit converter. So that's a huge difference in capacitance. Now to make matching work well, we typically implement a single C0 or C0, and then we tile it uh, many times in order to create two C0, four C0, eight C0, 16 C0, and so on and so forth, just so that we get better matching. But this re results in this huge capacitor array, and more importantly, we get a lot of CV squared energy coming from the reference in order to charge and discharge these large capacitors. So one possibility to reduce part of this power consumption is to build a main DAC and a sub DAC. Uh, and so the idea here is if you insert a single coupling capacitor, in this particular case, it has to be very sized very precisely, 32 over 31 C naught. And you can do some math to convince yourself why that would be a good um, size for, for that uh, coupling capacitor. Then basically what ends up happening is you're breaking your DAC into a main DAC and a sub DAC, and they're both equal size. And importantly, it's only two to the four C naught instead of two to the nine C naught in, in the worst case here. So you've significantly reduced 
the amount of capacitance in your DAC, which significantly reduces the ultimate uh, CV squared F power consumption when you are switching. So a colleague of mine, Marcus Yip, uh, wrote, wrote a paper a number of years ago in which he very carefully studied all of the different um, components of energy during the conversion process in the DAC, in the comparator, in the digital controller, uh, the leakage of all these blocks and so on. And uh, in most cases, all of these are either, ex are, are either quadratically dependent on VDD or in some cases, exponentially dependent on VDD, uh, in this case, for, for, for the leakage power. And so the conclusion from this analysis is that, hey, you know, all of these energy components scale very rapidly with VDD, so operating at lower voltages should offer some tremendous energy benefits. And so he ended up designing a SAR ADC, and you could sh see here that depending on the mode of operation, and perhaps let's focus on the red lines here, the 10-bit the mode of operation, you can see here that as you scale down the supply losses, your energy per, per conversion really just drops, uh, and it drops roughly quadratically, uh, depending on the sampling rate, if you are um, leakage dominated or not. In this case, we are not leakage dominated. Now, of course, as you scale down the supply voltage, you have less drive strength in all of your circuits. And so as a result, you can't clock things quite as fast as you used to be able to. Uh, and so as a result, your sampling frequency, the maximum possible sampling frequency will go down. So if you take a look at the figure of merit of this uh, analog to digital converter, what you'll find is that there's a point where you optimize the figure of merit, where you get the best trade-off between saving energy by scaling down the voltage, um, but uh, you know there's there's a trade-off with respect to the the leakage um, that will otherwise start to increase the uh, amount of energy per conversion uh, in your figure of merit. Okay, and uh, the optimal voltage depends on how many bits of resolution you're looking for and, and so on and so forth. So this is you know, kind of some nice uh, optimizations that, that one can do. There are other tricks uh, you can do to help reduce the energy consumption of your DAC. Uh, one other trick you can try is uh, what we call a split capacitor DAC. And the idea here is instead of switching the entire uh, MSB capacitor, you can break your MSB capacitor into uh, a subarray. And if you're clever about the way that you switch this subarray, you can help reduce the energy taken from the uh, reference voltage when, when you're switching. So for example, if you're switching on bit cycle two in the down position, in this particular case, you're gonna have two C of capacitance uh, with six C of capacitance over here. And the energy taken from the supply is five halves uh, C zero V ref squared uh, in a conventional circuit. But if you use this split DAC circuit, your energy from the reference voltage is gonna be one half C O V ref squared. Um, so this is kind of a nice way to uh, potentially um, um, uh, save some additional energy. So you can split this MSB capacitor into a subarray that looks identical to the main array to help improve things like matching and, and so on and so forth. And then you can add you know, other, other steps by uh, converting uh, it into a subarray with a main array and a sub DAC and so on and so forth. So you can kind of put in all the tricks here and help to really uh, reduce the energy consumption of your successive approximation analog to digital converter. Now this uh, particular work was published in 2011. Since then there have been you know, many other papers that have discussed other techniques to help reduce the power consumption to the point now where we are very near fundamental uh, limits in terms of our ability to um, operate some of the state-of-the-art ADCs. Um, so again, very short crash course into analog to digital converter design. If you want to learn more, there's absolutely tons of papers uh, available in the literature to read. Uh, ECE 264 is another course that uh, discusses these and so on, so I do encourage you to take a look at this.